Welcome to Mind Over Matter, where we feature young Jamaicans who are shooting for the stars. I'm your host, Margaret Boyne. Remember, if you haven't subscribed to the channel as yet, please do and hit that notification bell. We have another inspiring story of triumph over adversity and turning challenges into stepping stones. She's only 25 years old. She was nominated for the Prime Minister's Youth Award for Excellence in 2017. She is a recipient of the 2022 Erasmus Mundus Scholarship. From navigating financial hardships during her formative years to emerging as a beacon of achievement, she's bound to leave you motivated. My guest is Lawyer Horton. Welcome to Mind Over Matter, Lawyer. Thank you so much for having me, Mrs. Boyne. I was about to say, who is that? That, that's the person like me. <laughs> no one, no one but you. <laughs> but your story from facing financial challenges to achieving success is very inspiring. You grew up in St. Thomas. Can you tell us a little about early life in St. Thomas? Definitely. So my father was the minister of religion for the Christ Church, and that's Anglican Church in Morant Bay. So I grew up really nearby with my mother, my father, and my younger sister. When I look back on those days, I look back fondly. I remember chasing chickens. I had a dog, <laughs> Blackie, all the adventures. And for a significant part of living in Morant Bay, I was homeschooled by my mother. So those days were filled with dancing and like learning cursive on the blackboard. <laughs> oh, she was a teacher? Yes. There was some um, challenges as well? <clears throat> yes. So because I was living in St. Thomas, I went to school in Kingston. And that meant that every day I went into Kingston. Fortunately, my father was able to drive me in and out. But that was every single weekday. Sometimes on weekends, we'd, we'd even go in. And that can understandably be a little bit hectic. Yes, that must have been very tiring. Yes. And, you know, I had strict parents who wouldn't take no for an answer with the schoolwork, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But your parents split up and there was some, um, you had to move, you had to relocate. Tell us a little about that. Yes. So when I was 10, I passed for Immaculate Conception High School. And I'm saying a big hello to all the Mac Girl <laughs> Magic persons that are watching. <laughs> but at that point, we had moved to Kingston. But what had happened was my father stayed in Morant Bay and my mother, my sister and I moved to Kingston mm -hmm. because there were some, a little bit of problems going on within the family. And that that as a child of 10 years old it really struck me to my core mm. and that was the beginning of a long journey of my parents leading from separation then we went into custody of children and eventually to their divorce so what effect did that have on was this where the financial challenges started yes that was it one of the key differences between living in Morant Bay and living in Kingston is that I find that money goes a lot further when you're living in the rural areas. Mm -hmm. You can always go outside, pick a breadfruit, pick an apple, mm -hmm. move into Kingston and it's almost concrete jungle. There's no aki, no breadfruit around the corner mm -hmm. where you can pick more than so. And having been in a household where my parents just separated, what that meant is that funds were now a little tight at the time. Mm -hmm. And we we were struggling to keep up. Additionally, I was in a new phase of my life. That is high school. And high school is coming with these longer book lists. We were just really struggling to stay afloat at that point. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned Immaculate. Tell me a little about school at Immaculate. So I spent seven long years <laughs> at Immaculate. <laughs> I went there when I was 10 years old. Let me tell you, I remember in grade seven orientation, my father came with me and I had to tippy toe and he showed me how to use the water cooler. I wasn't <laughs> even five feet tall as yet. <laughs> <laughs> but Immaculate was truly a journey. So by then I am new in Kingston. 
And grade seven, I remember my mother would come and come leave home to come to Immaculate on the bus to pick me up and my sister and ensure that I made it back home. You know, just to make sure I didn't get myself up into any trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and where, how far were you living from Immaculate at that time? I was living in the Crossroads area. So okay. Okay. But Immaculate was really, it was, it allowed me to become the woman that mm. I am today. There were a lot of educational, a lot of stretch. The whole notion of flunking was just not known. When I look back, even the bare minimum that was set for CSEC was that we had to do eight subjects. And that about five or six of those were mandatory subjects. And so within your cohort, you know, you'd be talking to students and You'd say, oh, so-and-so got a two. And you'd be like, oh, no, but he got a three. The horror. <laughs> so it was very competitive. <laughs> yes. <laughs> By the time I got to graduation, they were ranking us for graduation. I came fourth in my graduating class. I think where a lot of the growth happened was sixth form. I went to sixth form somewhat unwillingly. Because I wanted to go out and work at fifth form. All right, and but before um before you reach sixth form, let let us go back to um how well you did in CSEC because you did very well in CSEC. Tell us about that. You can't just gloss over that just so. <laughs> you are so right. <laughs> so at the CSEC level, I sat eleven subjects in one sitting. And that, there are two reasons for that. One, I had no idea what I wanted to be. And so it was very hard to narrow down the subjects that I wanted to do. And secondly, my mother had plans for me to go to university. And so I would need a scholarship to do that. So we had to do this mm -hmm. large number of subjects to make sure I could stand out of the crowd. So mm -hmm. that was 11 subjects in one sitting. And I got all ones. In a few Ooh. of those subjects, I even placed in the Caribbean. That's just remarkable. But but during this time, though, you are still having financial problems. And how did Immaculate step in? How did they support you during this time? All right. So there were some times when I couldn't go to school. There was no money, no food in the house. And I had teachers who would assist. They would give money out of their own pockets mm. for me to go to school. Or sometimes I'd go to school and I'd be unable to go home. Or if I go get to school, I can't buy lunch. I usually carried lunch, but if the household is empty, there's nothing. nothing. These teachers would step in and contribute out of their own pockets. After a while, what happened was that I approached the principal, I asked to meet with her and explain to her how hard things were at home. And she was able to connect me with an alumna who was willing to give funds to help support me at home. Mm -hmm. So you so you didn't feel any way about that lawyer, like, you know, some persons wouldn't want to ask for help or would feel a waste by school affair, help them and all of that. I know what you mean, because for me to get to that point to approach my principal took a lot of effort. In fact, I remember my best friend and I were in a classroom working out my expenses. What would it take? <laughs> <laughs> because suppose I ask her for, say, $100 for groceries and this is too much. So I know what you mean. But I also had, a, I remember one teacher in particular, in particular who would emphasize to me that closed mouths do not get Head. Mm. and she said you have to speak up you have to ask and she was speaking to me in a completely different concept but the and, thought stuck and lawyer repeat repeat that my Those audience mouths <laughs> do not get fed and I have a supplementary one to that from my guidance counselor mm -hmm. ask for a hundred percent of what you want a hundred percent of the time when she told me that I was about I was in grade nine, so I was about 13. And I remember leaning back in my chair and thinking, you and I don't have the same experience. You cannot say to me, ask for a hundred percent. People will judge me, they'll shun me. But you see, the more that I have seen in life and the more that I've the more that the older I've gotten, mm. I realize 
it's really about asking for 100 percent of what you want mm -hmm. just knowing how to do it tactfully okay so you went to sixth form and it was with the um the alumna's help yes so Throughout my school career, we had a big sister program. These are alumni who, alumni who would come into the school and just speak to us about their experiences. When I was in sixth form, I had an alumna come to the school. She was relaying her experience. And I just put up my hand in class and said, you know, thank you for sharing. Does your company offer us any scholarship for students? And at that point, at that point, he said, yes, by the way, the program will open in April. And I took up my organizer and wrote it down. April came around, I applied, and I got a scholarship to do my CAPE exams in Upper Six. I was so grateful. <laughs> and my tuition was paid as well for Upper Six. Yes, and, and you did very well at CAPE as well. You mash up all of that. With that. You were the highest rated highest ranked female in the region for Cape Computer Science. Yes, I was. And I ended up taking a total of five units of Cape in the, for unit one and then four, four unit two Cape, Cape subjects, so a total of nine. And again, I got all ones. Mm, so for computer science, no, you have always had a love for, for that? Yes. So my very first computer came home because mommy and daddy were able to get it from a funeral home. They were <laughs> disposing of it. <laughs> Can you tell us about that? <laughs> they were disposing of it. My parents realized this computer wave is happening. My children need to be a part of this. Okay. And so this came home. So how old were you at that time? about three or four somewhere oh, there they're very young oh. we called the computer meow meow because there was a game on it with a cat <laughs> <laughs> okay so you were oh. you you were dabbling and and trying new stuff and all of that from early definitely and i want to give special kudos to my mother she went she went out of her way to acquire cds that with little educational i'm not saying little major education mm -hmm. games i can think of, there was such a wide variety and in, neither of my parents were particularly neither of my parents was particularly skilled in using the computer mm -hmm. but they really went above and beyond to make sure that i got the opportunity needed mm. Okay, so you now left um sixth form going off to university. How did those funds come up come about for university? Everybody around me though was applying for university. I must say Immaculate really does tailor a culture where it's expected mm -hmm. that when you finish the sixth mm -hmm. form, you're going to go on to further education. Mm -hmm. We had mm -hmm. a counselor on staff just to groom us towards that tertiary experience. And her name was Mrs. Metalor. She would read through the essays. And I remember going to Mrs. Metalor. My mother said she wants me to get a first degree. When I Google first degree, they're telling me about engineering and boats. And I don't really know what a first degree is. <laughs> and she sat down with me and she said, okay, first degree is undergraduate degree. And she spoke it to me. I'm like, okay, I think I got this. But then in true teenage rebellion, I'm like, Nobody else in my family has a degree from university. Therefore, I probably, at 17 years old, need to go to work. So I will just apply to go to university part-time. 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 Mm -hmm. Mommy thinking I'm giving in the application full-time. <laughs> As I'm going ar around, you know, gathering reference. And, 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 and lawyer, I guess you wanted to help out. You wanted to have a job that you can help you know, with the bills at home. Of course. Mm. As I'm going around gathering references, one of my teachers says to me, do not apply part-time, apply full-time. You can switch to part-time later if you maybe you can't get a job on campus or something, but do not apply for part-time. And those were the words that really helped me because in applying for full-time, for full-time 
for a full-time program at UE, I became eligible for more scholarships. And so working in tandem with prepar preparing for the CXC examinations, I am writing these scholarship applications. And these are tedious applications. Mm. They require essays, documentation. So I would write them in the nights. I'd carry them to school for my teacher, the counselor, Mrs. Metalor, to read them. I'd be collecting references. And then mommy would walk to go and mail them. So mommy's walking from Crossroads to New Kingston. She's finding her way as far as up to you to drop off scholarship documentation. Mm -hmm. And we're still, it felt, I remember just feeling like, everything was happening but absolutely nothing was happening because every day you're getting a call about you know maybe you need to give more documentation or maybe you ask for a document and a particular entity can't give it to you and you're fighting these daily battles but nothing is happening and at that point I'm thinking you know maybe I'm not meant for university and that's fine I'll just come back to it later mm. and then with each interview I went to Sometimes it felt like you have to prove that you're poorer than the next person. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. So why are you? What would happen if we don't give you these funds? Yes. So is it a thing that nobody else could help you? What about this person? And it just felt like a race to the bottom. <laughs> mm -hmm. But in the midst of all of this, right when I decided, okay, maybe I won't go to university. The floodgates open and I received, started to receive scholarships, partial scholarships, full scholarships. But still, even if the tuition was paid, I still needed to be able to afford going to university and not working. The week before the, the, week before the school was supposed to open, I was actually on campus because of the poor laptop I had had given out before university even started. And I was trying to get someone to fix it on campus. And then guess what? I got a call that I was a UE Open Scholar. Wow. So so how, how did you feel about that? What did you do when you heard the news? <laughs> Sitting here with the laptop that the person beside me was trying to do CPR on. <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you that is nice <laughs> do you recall anything of me I was very calm about it yeah <laughs> at that point I had even accepted another scholarship which would not have given me a stipend just covered my tuition mm. so I was like okay fine no problem it was after I hung up that phone it really occurred to me UE Open Scholarship means that I went up against other students in the Caribbean and I was deemed to be among the top and then not only will I be getting tuition paid but also there's an there's room for your accommodation to be paid a stipend to help you get to school I was like wow awesome that scholarship was for the three entire years that you were there or you had that was just a wow. So what, what degree did you do at UE? So I started out doing a Bachelor of Science with a major in computer science. And mm. then I took on a minor in management studies. Mm -hmm. So during that time, you told me you're an exchange student at Waterloo. At Waterloo. University of Waterloo. Now tell me about that experience. I applied to be an exchange student and I rec at the time that I did it was around the end of my first semester of UE mm -hmm. and so I started to look around for courses that would match what I'm going to do in my second year I, and then I had one criteria in my mind I want to see snow mm. oh. <laughs> <laughs> so say so I had to go to um, a very cold country Yes. In Canada. <laughs> Definitely. And Miss Terrell from the International Students Office was really life-changing support for me. Towards the end of me applying and hearing that I got another scholarship to cover my expenses in Canada, then, <laughs> then my mother comes in and she <clears throat> says to me, but hold on, you are packing up at 
I, I, I would have been 19 when I was there, but around the time when this conversation was happening, I was 18. To leave me, to go across the world, to, buy your, to spend time and study by yourself, and mommy was like oh no we're calling this off no this is too dangerous <laughs> and Mr. Rell talked mommy back into it no this is not too dangerous please send yeah. her. Oh. so that no tell me about the experience in Canada that experience was intense if I had to use one word it would have been intense mm. firstly I looked at my accommodation on my own using an online version of like classifieds kind of like a yellow pages because you know as a teenager you feel no fair you know mm -hmm. and I ended up living in someone's basement because mm -hmm. I saw upstairs and downstairs on the advertisement and didn't know that downstairs meant <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> my so call to my parents. I can't imagine I'm I'm underground like underground where like under people's feet <laughs> but so you went to China as well. Um, you have to tell me a little about that because that must have been like like a culture shock. Yes. So I was a Huawei seed for the future. This was the very first time that this program was coming to Jamaica, and I was I was sponsored to go and learn about five G technologies. There I would have met persons from Trinidad, Guyana, Kuwait. And just all their learning, hands-on learning, one culture, language, mm -hmm. and about the 5G technologies. So you're out of, um, you graduated um, first class honors and you're at home. So you decide to work. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> you're right, finally. <laughs> and you went to, was it NCD? I first went to KPMG. KPMG, okay. I and started then, out as a and junior then IT auditor there. Okay. And then NCD. So you were able now to, you know, to help the family, finances, everything kind of running better. Oh, okay. what was that like? I think you, you, you were at home during the pandemic as well. Yes. <laughs> and what was that like? All right. So when I started to work at KPMG, what had happened was I got the job a little after I graduated. So graduation, I got my degree July 1 and I started working almost immediately. I started to help out paying for the rent and it was just piecing together. OK, if I do this, then I can help a little bit more. But that also meant that a lot of responsibility was mm -hmm. sitting on the shoulders. My sister is still in school. I need to help out. There were bouts of unemployment happening in my family on and off. Mm -hmm. And I really felt the pressure. Your mother was ill at the time? So she ha she was experiencing some on and off bouts of illness at that mm -hmm. point in time, mm -hmm. which later became exacerbated a little after I changed jobs. Mm -hmm. so, so it was a lot of pressure. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I changed jobs in the middle of the pandemic. I started working at NCB as a business process analyst. That same teacher who encouraged me to go to university on a full-time basis, I met her again at the library and she told me about this job opening. <laughs> and I just used just a guardian angel in my life. So redirection. I am now, I, so I'm now a business process analyst. Well, I was at that time. And a lot of a lot of things changed, but you know, to whom much is given, much is mm. expected. And my sister was in university at that time, so I was able to help out with her tuition. I was helping out more in the household. And then around January, my mother fell ill. Mm. She she was fall, she felt as if she was falling, caught herself and injured her back. Mm. And so what that meant, she was struggling to get out of bed. And my mother is a very proud woman. So she wouldn't really let me help much. But she was also physically struggling. Mm -hmm. And I was also working at home during that time. I had a very, very, very supportive manager who told me, do what you need to do in order to, in order to figure things out in this time. 
But, you know, it, it also can't let the work responsibilities lapse. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to abuse that kind of kindness. It almost felt like I was burning the candle at both ends. But gradually, my mother started to feel better. So all of that, it just felt like it was one thing after another. At that time, my sister is still in university. I'm still helping out there. I'm trying as well to see if I can go back to school mm -hmm. because I, I loved my job, but I also knew that there was more out there. Right. Mm -hmm. So I started to look into master's opportunities, but the ones I was seeing seemed a little too complicated to apply for, meaning they would want me to do additional examinations, maybe do an English examination. And working full time, it just didn't seem to make sense. And I was there on and off every now and again, you know, my mother chirps in, you really should go back to school. <laughs> hmm. And about 2022, I just, no, probably the end, yeah, 2022, I decided, no, about 2020, I, I'm going back up, definitely 2021, 20, mm -hmm. end of the year that my mother fell ill. I decided I was going back to school. So I started to apply for the scholarships again because if I didn't get a scholarship, I could not go back to school. And I started to apply for scholarships overseas. I just felt like I needed to see more of the world. I told you once I realized that so plain nice, never looked <laughs> back. <laughs> so you applied for the Erasmus Mundus Scholarship in 2022. How did you learn about the scholarship and tell us a little about it? All right. So in 2017, I was nominated for the Prime Minister's Youth Award for Excellence in Academics. And although I wasn't successful at the time, one of the two persons who won in that category was an Erasmus Mundus Scholar. And so it was from that point I started to research and I could not find a program under that Erasmus umbrella that's aligned with me however in 2022 a new program was launched under that erasmus umbrella oh. european master in law data and artificial intelligence and mm. that was a perfect match for me yes with your background in computer science yeah. so it's a joint program joint yes, and it's offered by the european commission Yes, so it's funded by the European Commission. And mm -hmm. by virtue of this program being a joint master's, it means that I do two years, one in Ireland and the other in Spain. Mm. So presently you're in Ireland? Yes, I am. Oh. But I will be moving to Spain next month. Oh, so how has the experience been so far? in Ireland or as they call it here island <laughs> <laughs> yes there's a lot of variety I think that's what attracts me here mm -hmm. one day you can go through all four seasons but also <laughs> <laughs> this is also a multicultural melting pot you never know who you will meet in fact I have my own Jamaican community here and we oh, even fun. celebrated independence yes <laughs> Oh, that sounds lovely, mad. Okay. <laughs> so what school, I mean, has it lived up to your expectations? Certainly. Mm -hmm. And I'm particularly looking forward to in the next year when I'll be learning in Spanish and focusing on cybersecurity, which is my specialization within this master's. But you mentioned learning in Spanish. So what? It's, it's a Spanish and an English um degree yes two in one two countries two languages the full nine yards <laughs> i took spanish in high school to up until the cape level and immaculate mm -hmm. has a very robust spanish program where at the cape level we had four teachers one for literature one for listening writing and grammar and uh, i'm missing one but there were four. <laughs> but but this program seemed as if it was made just for you. <laughs> Timing and everything. <laughs> well, how how did the Spanish part come about during the application? So when the application came out, it came out late after the other programs. Mm. And uh, I wrote them before I applied, gave them my CAPE certificates that showed that I did Spanish 
and said, is this enough? And in the back of my head, I'm hoping, say it's not enough so I can just move on. <laughs> <laughs> they said, yes, my ones in Spanish are more than sufficient. I'm like, oh no, I'm going to have to apply for this now. <laughs> and so I did a Spanish interview. At that point, I'm starting to get nervous because I don't speak Spanish in my day-to-day -day life. It is what I learned in school and the fact that I love Spanish so much that I kept my phone in Spanish, I read media in Spanish, but not to the point where I practice daily. Then I did the interview and I contacted my Spanish teacher from high school <laughs> to coach me. <laughs> got it. When I arrived here, I am the only person who did a Spanish interview for the program that made it into the program. Whoa, amazing. You're at the University of Dublin? Dublin City University. You're at Dublin City University. So tell me now, what are the challenges that you've had since you've been in on the program? And how have you overcome them? Time management is, is a big one because mm. I am also a student ambassador, which is a paid role on campus where I do campus tours, I, I message students, just ask, just answering questions they may have. Mm -hmm. Or I also work in the call center calling offer holders. And I try to balance that with the intense course content. Mm -hmm. And because courses are so varied between computing and law, it can sometimes feel like you're being pulled in multiple directions. Mm -hmm. On top of that, I am the elected student and alumni board president for my cohort. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that means I try to look forward. How can we make sure that the incoming cohort has the smoothest possible experience? Mm -hmm. While balancing that behind us with my current cohort, how can we make sure that, they, that my cohort gets the best opportunity to interact with each other to really know the core of what Erasmus Mundus is about mm -hmm. while being new to this myself but you have you have adapted so well um lawyer <laughs> so at the end of the program you'll be coming back to Jamaica I haven't decided yet <laughs> <laughs> a lot has happened in these two years it has felt like a whirlwind <laughs> a whirlwind so I'm not sure what next steps are but one thing for certain wherever I go I know I'll make an impact you're the first person in your family to have earned a, a first degree how do you feel about this accomplishment being the first person in my family to get a university degree is my proudest accomplishment to date and this does not mean that I haven't accomplished anything after that of worth but it is because I know that getting a university degree doesn't mean that I was smart enough to do it, but more that I was able to persevere against the odds. It means that I over and over was able to be in the right place at the right time with the support of the right people. And sometimes I think about this quote I saw some time ago, that some persons are their ancestors' wildest dreams. And I think I fall in that category. I accomplish what my ancestors perhaps could have only dreamt of. I am being fully funded right now to study in Europe because of the hard work that I put in and the support of those around me in getting that first degree. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure your parents, your family must be proud of you. Uh, the obvious one in this is I have the world's best little sister. Not so little anymore, but <laughs> she believes in me a hundred percent. When I was applying for the scholarships, she had a sign inside the house saying, ask my sister if she has applied to any scholarships recently. <laughs> <laughs> strategic determined and just my biggest support mm -hmm. and this is a chance to though to tell them thanks especially your mother who has you know been your support during all this i want to say a big big thank you to my entire family from my sister who keeps me going, from my mother who knew which direction I was going in, even when I didn't know, to my mm -hmm. father who, when I get up and say, by the way, I'm going to study in Europe, 
he doesn't even bat an eyelid anymore. <laughs> Just supports to my teachers with their unwavering belief in me, who used to help me when I was in high school out of the small money that they were getting. And just to all those persons who just heard me with a dream and decided to support along the way. Thank you. So before you leave, what advice do you have to give to someone who feels stuck or, you know, think, are they thinking of pursuing higher education but don't know how? I think the first thing would be, I at no point want anyone to listen to this 30 minute synopsis of what has happened throughout my life. This highlights real and decide based on that, okay, once I get a scholarship, all will be well, all will be fixed. This mm -hmm. is just the highlights real. Mm -hmm. There is so much more that's going on on the day to day, even after you get funding. Getting mm -hmm. funding is just the beginning. You need to keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. But if there's one piece of advice that I could leave behind, it would be, I strongly believe that this is all worth it. Mm -hmm. I never regretted it going the extra mile in my academic work I have seen it paid off and I would like to lean on the words of my guidance counselor ask for a hundred percent of what you want a hundred percent of the time a lot of times you know what you're facing and you know what you require in order to get there if you know that you need a stipend along with your scholarship in order to get your foot into the door then look for that ask for that speak up and just don't quit it does get better but oftentimes it doesn't get better in a linear fashion yes lawyer thank you for sharing your story and it's a story of determination and you know showing that if you have the right mindset you're able to achieve anything and I want to wish you all the best I hope I'll hear from you after you you finish in Spain hope I'll hear about the Spanish part of your journey <laughs> and all the best thank you so so much <laughs> and i wish you all the best please continue to do this program and thank you for having me yeah.